two songs. Matt Smith. He says, uh, hey Comic-Con, I'm gutted that I can't be there with you today. This is fairly typical for me. <laughs> the first time I had to catch a plane to Belfast to do Thrones, I forgot my passport. So the fact that the first time I get to come and do Comic-Con with all of you lot for House of the Dragon, I get COVID feels about right. I am deeply honored that so many of you have turned up to show your excitement for House of the Dragon. We've dedicated at least uh, the last three years of our lives to making this show and hope that it is everything you want it to be, plus maybe a little bit that you weren't expecting. And you'll finally get to see what we've been cooking in less than a month. I hope you like dragons. <laughs> he says, if I wasn't highly infectious, I'd be dancing in the streets of San Diego with excitement right now. But instead, that duty must fall to our incredible cast. Uh, this show would not have been possible without their passion, their talent, and their relentless hard work. They have elevated the show to another level, as you'll see. Anyway, enough of me. Fire will rain. Peace out, mate. Thank you. Brian, George, set the stage for us. What, what can we expect from House of the Dragon? Uh, fire and blood. <laughs> and Greg, yeah. Um, I think the I think the most compelling thing about uh, this particular story, and I think it's the reason that this was the spinoff successor show, as George calls them, that he was most excited about, is because it delves into the history of the Targaryen dynasty, and that's something that we hear about in A Song of Ice and Fire in the pages of the book and the original series, Game of Thrones, but we never really get a real sense of it. So this series begins at the absolute pinnacle of the dynasty, the height of power and wealth and influence. They have the most dragons that they'll ever have, uh, and it's just before the, uh, the bloom starts to come off the rose. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. Uh, Patty, Your Grace, um, King Viserys, our King Viserys. How's the throne? Comfortable? It was lovely, yeah. I couldn't wait to get on it. I got very territorial with that throne, and I wouldn't allow anybody else to sit on it. That's fine. Why doesn't anybody put pillows on it? Well, it's part of it is because it's supposed to be uncomfortable to sit on, I think. You know, I didn't have a pillow, by the way. I suffered on that throne. So, um, but yeah, it's not, it's not a comfortable thing. It's made of salt, so, you know. It should be a relaxing experience sitting up there. What kind of a what kind of a ruler is is King Viserys? He's a he's a kind man. I think he inherited the uh, you know the crown because he was uh, in my view he was a, he was a good scholar and a, and a man of good temperament and a kind man who's trying to sort of keep the peacetime going within the kingdom. Um, and I think that's why he was chosen as uh, as, as king. Um, but he's a man who's. Uh, what I, want, what I wanted to do with the character when, when I read the script was just imbue it with as much humanity as I could um, and bring as much much kind of life to him as I possibly could. But he's a man that cares about things. There's great tragedy in him. He loves his family, cares about his position. But he's also carrying something else that's a kind of secret that's revealed in the show that uh, you know kind of refers to the, the potential fall of man in the future. So. Uh, 
there's lots of different things going on. Speaking of that family, Matt, our Damon Targaryen, what's that relationship like, that brother relationship like? With his brother? Yeah, okay, go on, give it him. <laughs> It's complicated. I mean, that was the sort of heartbeat for me, really, and I had such a fabulous time with Paddy. Um, yeah, it's, it's quite a complicated relationship, <laughs> but I sort of hope that me and Paddy found a lot of depth and a lot of richness in, uh, in the work that we did. But really, everything is about his brother. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Eve, our, uh, our Rainies, the queen that never was, what does, what does that moniker mean to her? Sorry, could you repeat all oh, that word? <laughs> um, the queen that never was. Yeah. Um, what does that mean? What does that mean to Rennie's? What does the title mean? To yeah. How does she? How does she relate to? It really pisses her off. I think. <laughs> she should have been the queen. And I was, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it's kind of annoying that she isn't. And it's also kind of annoying that people keep remembering and reminding her that she. So, um, yeah, that's what I have to say. Always our queen. Thank you! <laughs> uh, Steve, our, our Corliss Valerian, uh, part of Renice's family, tell us about that, that badass sailor adventurer that is Corliss. Um, well, I could talk for hours about that, but I'll spare you that. Um, so, basically, he is uh, a famed nautical man. He did his first solo voyage, I think, in his teens. He built his first ship called the Sea Snake at the age of about 20, 21. And he went on these famed nine voyages, which is the basis of the fortune that he has amassed when we meet him in this series. So at the time that we, we meet them, he's uh, an extremely wealthy man in this land. And that's through his adventures. He's a self-made man. Fabian, I'm going to keep Dorn. People appreciate his hard work. Thank you. <laughs> Fabian, our man from Dorn, uh, a, a, a vibrant fighter. How's the sword play going? Uh, better than when I started. Um, our first rehearsal with Matt smashed him in the face with a sword. <laughs> And I thought yeah, I was going to get pretty quickly. You did. Yeah, I did. It's Oh, yeah, I know, I know. Um, so, yeah, getting better. Yeah. Emma, Rhaenyra, uh, what drives her? What drives Rhaenyra? Uh, fire. <laughs> um, yeah, I think Rhaenyra is uh, fueled by. Um, that old Targaryen stuff. Um, and I think probably the journey she goes on in the series is uh, one of working out when to uh, let that fire burn and when to dampen it. Um... George, uh, what's it like seeing these characters come to life from this part of, of Westeros' history, second century of the Targaryen? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's pretty exciting. Um, we're always, uh, Nervous at the beginning because yeah, uh, you know these these books these characters are like my kids, uh, and when you give your kid to uh, people for adoption, you wonder how they will be treated. Will they be um, you know? Will you recognize them when they come back to you and all that? But I'm I've been very very fortunate here. I think Brian has done a, a great job of adapting uh, the books so, so far. Uh, <laughs> and thank you. <laughs> And the, our cast here is amazing. I haven't had a chance to meet them, unfortunately. With COVID, I didn't get to uh, visit the set and uh, hang around as I did uh, on a certain other show in the past. Um, but um, <laughs> I've seen nine of the ten episodes, and it's pretty, uh, it's pretty amazing. Um, pretty amazing. I'm, I'm really uh, very happy. Brian, you mentioned all those dragons. We can't wait to see the dragons. We love the dragons. Um, how did you make them have their own personalities? How did you differentiate them from each other? Well, that was really important for, uh, for the show because there are uh, 17 of them at, uh, at, at the height of this. 
So it was really important to, to as you said, differentiate them, uh, not only the way they looked, but the way they behaved and acted, and the way they bonded with the riders. And uh, Miguel and I, uh, I think that was one of the earliest things that we started concepting on. This is probably about a year before we started filming. And it was a very organic process. We worked with a couple of um, conceptual designers uh, that uh, we went, just went through this very iterative process. And of course, uh, George, uh, who uh, writes very detailed books, gave us the gift of uh, specifying color and size and age. So we really took all of those things that are that are given to us in the book and then tried to extrapolate them and add personalities to them. Like Caraxes is very uh, is very cantankerous and agitated. And he's always moving and flexing. He's never he never sits still, much like his rider. Um, <laughs> And uh, and yeah, it just it, it, we we built out from Cyrax and Craxes, Vagar, the biggest dragon, uh, and certainly alive uh, right now, Behemoth, and and then uh, went on to the you know second tier and third tier dragons. And, we, and we, we've designed dragons that you won't even see yet in season one because we have, we're having such a great time with the designers. Uh, so we're very I'm very excited to show. You've seen some some teases in the trailer, but there's much yet to come, and I think you guys will like it a lot. Woo! For our group, was there was there a moment when you felt like maybe it's when you first got in costume or you first got a sword in your hand or something when you felt like oh I think I'm beginning to understand this character I think I've got it. The wig. The wig. Yeah. <laughs> it's all the wig. <laughs> Some, yeah, it's like a, a Targaryen rite of passage, maybe. Um, uh, yeah, I felt like that was the first time I realized that I was actually going to do this show. Any the wig does all the work. <laughs> any, any favorite dragons? Any Caraxes. Caraxes is the best dragon. Maybe. <laughs> he is the best dragon. The, the most he is the best dragon. He's definitely the best dragon. The most handsome. The most wonderful player and the most beautiful. <laughs> Just, since the story is so much about succession, I wonder if you thought about if you personally ruled, not your character, if you personally ruled, what would your first decree be? <laughs> I'd allow them to dye their hair. <laughs> so I don't have to get in the ring. It takes an hour and a half. It's, you know, it looks great, but it's a pain in the arse of the car. <laughs> Pants for the ladies. The, going to a toilet in a portaloo on the top of a mountain in so many skirts and tights and thermals, you were just covered in shit. It's horrible. <laughs> not, not, not shit, but you know, like... <laughs> Most. <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> uh, for, for our uh, Rhaenyra's and our Allison's, uh, Millie and Emily, and Emma, Emily and Olivia, um, what was it like playing characters at two different stages of life. How did you work it out or not work it out? How did you how did you build that character? Um, well, we we didn't. Yeah. We've never met. Like we've met like <laughs> three, times, three, four times. Yeah. Like a handful of times. So that was kind of weird. Being like, oh, I play you, never met you. Um, so yeah, I don't. Know. Yeah, I think like I, I feel like maybe I had the easier job in that uh, I, I was thinking about when you see photos of yourself as a child or like camcorder footage and that person's really familiar, but they're also quite distinct from who you are today. And I, I felt that so hard when I like I saw episode one and, uh, and, and I saw you and it was like watching like Targaryen home video. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like that is not, I, I'm somewhere else now, but like, I know you, uh, it's lovely, yeah. Uh, has anybody thought about, again, so much about succession is, is what drives this drama. What's the best, the ideal ruler for Westeros would have what kind of traits? What do you think, Ed? Um, George. 
<laughs> well, I, I, I think one of the fundamental things is, uh, in a good king, is someone who regards being king as a duty rather than a, a privilege that they are entitled to. Or queen. Um, and and around to dispense justice, to have peace, and occasionally to do, uh, you know, boring things like building roads and uh, sanitation in King's Landing and all that. Nobody really wants to do a spin-off show about King Jaehaerys builds the roads. Uh, <laughs> um, but I do think if you actually lived in Westeros, you, you might like a king who's more concerned with building roads than, uh, than fighting wars. And Viserys, of course, who, who comes to the uh, throne when the old king dies, uh, that's a, sort of his goals too. I mean, he want, he doesn't want. Well, I, he does kind of at the end of his life. He wants a little glory, but uh, he, he's not driven by glory. He wants to be a, a good king, a wise king, to protect his people. I think those are the most important traits. Yeah, yeah I mean, I I really love the way that um, Patty embodied uh, King Viserys because I think in the in the reading of the book you can get this impression that he's, he's he's passive and he's a people pleaser and he's just trying to keep the peace all the time and he is but he's i, I think um the thing that patty brought to the to to, the, to viserys was this uh real in, inner fire and his his passion for uh being being uh, a people pleaser and, and trying to keep everybody united fighting to do so knowing that we're sitting at the top of the heap here and if i let order break apart war will follow, and it's my duty to not let that happen. So he fiercely tries to keep everybody together, but it's Game of Thrones, so everybody has their own political agendas and desires for power and strength and influence. And I actually think, I, I think Viserys, Patty's Viserys in particular, is a, uh, is a very modern uh, uh, ruler that is a, uh, a bit of an anathema in this, in this, in a medieval period like this that respects might and strength and masculinity um, and, uh, and it, what Viserys what Viserys does and is remembered for I think is is not necessarily in line with the way he attempted to rule his kingdom Emma, Emma brings up a great point why not a queen when Aegon uh, invaded 66 percent of the, uh, the dragon pilots were, were female uh, what is it George Ryan or anyone what is it about Westeros that they're just so anti a queen? Yeah, great question. <laughs> I'd like to know. You know, I, I, my books are fantasies, obviously, but I do follow history a lot. I get inspiration from history, and then I take elements from history and I turn it up to 11, uh, you know, obligatory spinal tap reference, or yeah. <laughs> to 111. Um, Game of Thrones, as, as many people have observed, was based very loosely on the Wars of the Roses. This show was based on an earlier period of English history called the Anarchy. And, uh, you know, I, I pilfered freely from real history. Uh, when Henry I, uh, the, the King of England, when his only legitimate son uh, drowned while trying to cross the English Channel, um, he was left with only one legitimate child, which was his daughter Matilda, and he named her his heir, and he made all the lords of the kingdom swear uh, their fealty to her. Um, and then some years later he died, and most of the lords of the kingdom forgot about that old source, and no, it doesn't apply, because here comes her cousin, Stephen, who crosses the channel quickly and, and steals the treasury and gets himself crowned king, and you enter the period called the Anarchy, where uh, Maud or Matilda, she was known, and Stephen fought for a, a decade, two decades, whatever, yeah. Marvel, bloody. Yes, all the good stuff. None of the building roads, peaceful things. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the inspiration there. I don't, I don't think Westeros is particularly uh, more anti-woman or more misogynistic than real life and what we call history. Yeah. Um, People fear change. Mm. I mean, we also have it fixed though, right? Like we still choose male rulers, like it's 2022, and we're, we, we tend to pick men. And I think one of the questions of the series is, 
uh, if you are a woman looking to rule, how do you convince male subjects that you're not other? Like that is that's kind of a question. I don't know. It has, I don't know. It has an answer. We don't have an answer. But um, there. The blood of old Valeria is well represented up here. How is how's everyone's high Valerian? Can we order lunch? Can we? <laughs> Millie can. Millie can. No, uh, yeah. Millie's really excellent at it. I don't. I no. Millie is the best. I can only order a cappuccino. I don't know. I only know what I said in the scene of how to say high Valerian. Even then, I don't even know what I'm saying. Um, but it was fun. I mean, me and Matt had a lot of high Valerian scenes together. A lot. A lot. Um, which was fun. Did anybody else speak? Paddy? I had one line. Yeah. I think it's been cool. <laughs> Let me try and remember it. It's something like Scorpi dorsos adriso dromo tom epsa unerati la dixan cortas. Um, yeah. I, obviously the, the shoot can be super intensive, but how do you, how did you guys have fun on set? How did you blow off some steam? Boxing? Darts? Trivia night? I wish. That's going to be in the rider yeah. next yeah, yeah. season. Well, if there is the next season, I don't know. Um, we, there was a chocolate table um, that Reese would um, flirt with up until 5 p.m. and then he just ravaged the whole entire table. Reese plays Otto Hightower um, and he um, isn't here today, which is upsetting, but um, he's great. He also had like a, an amazing way of eating crisps where he would sort of like <laughs> finger the bag and really, and then it would spill everywhere, <laughs> all over, and then he would run off and be like, well, wow, there's a massive mess here. I hope understand where this comes from. Also, the joys of watching him take the absolute piss out of Fabian. I could see, like, cogs turning in Reese's head as he's looking at Fabian, and then he'll just be like, Fabian, ever thought about playing a teenage werewolf? And it was just... And then he'd be, you'd be Teen Wolf for yeah, three enough. weeks until yeah, yeah. something else. Yeah, he started a lot of rumours on the set, most of which I don't think I should share. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a world that is famed for its iconography, the Valerian steel swords, dragon eggs, the iron throne. Any particular favorite prop, and I ask because if you can steal it from me, that would be super great, but any, any favorite props, any favorite item from the world? Mm -hmm. My knife. Mm -hmm. It's a very important knife. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my knife. I wanted to keep it. But, um, you know, they're very hot on that on the show, so they wouldn't let me take a knife. And, uh, yeah, trying to nick one was hard as well, so... Yeah, that was the thing for me, I quite liked having a knife. I thought they'd give it me at the end, HBO. You know, I was a good king after all. <laughs> they didn't want to listen to they give me a fucking knife. <laughs> uh, HBO, please give him the knife. Uh, no? Um, Sorry, Brian, I'm here for a second. Movie and television props is a wonderful podcast. I do. What dreams are made of. Yes. So I expect at the end of the show you'll make over all the really good props. I'm, I'm going to get a knife for Patty. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Thank you, Ruben. Make it happen. Great plug for Ryan's podcast. Thank you, by the way, George. <laughs> Ryan, as a, as a prop connoisseur, mm. anything that you were really geeked out about to see? All of it. <laughs> yeah, it was all and everything was great because every it's it's a wonderful uh, kind of show for that because everything has to be custom made. You can't really buy stuff off the shelf. All the costumes are bespoke. Uh, all the all the all the weapons are custom made for the show. Every everything banners. Uh, so it's just a feast of the are eyes. You, are, are the severed heads going to be custom made, or, or can you get a box of severed heads like we did with Caleb? Uh, we we have a specific uh, budget line item in season two for custom severed heads. Ah, uh, very good. <laughs> I did nick something. What is it? Oh, I will never tell you what it was because no one's known it's gone missing. But I did steal something. Come after me. Erase, erase this tape. Erase this tape. 
Um, for our group, how much of family is so important to this story? Did you did you lean on any of your own family history to try and, and find the drama here, or is it just all on the page for you? I'm not sure. <laughs> I, pretty much on the page. I mean, I, I, my family history doesn't involve no, murder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's as far as I know. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I think for the most part it was what's on the page and then trying to equate the value you have for your relationship into the character's value for his or her relationship, I think. That's kind of how I approach it anyway. Are you a sailing man now, Steve? <laughs> no, no, I actually get seasick, which is, uh, <laughs> doesn't all go well, but uh, no, I don't. But, but I was kind of jealous because my whole family all get to ride dragons, and I don't, which is, uh, thank Hello, you. Hello, 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 someone here loves me. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, indeed. There you go. Uh, that was Jason. Uh, yes. Emily Carey uh, impressed uh, both Miguel and I. Uh, really out of our seats on, on uh, one of her first days on set because she does uh, journaling in character as a way of learning her, her background. Emily, you should talk about that because it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, so I find it one of the best ways to like get into character. And for Alison, we had so much creative freedom, like all of us as a group, including Millie and Reese as well, to sort of make up this whole backstory to her. Obviously when we find Alison, she doesn't have a mother and um, there were some, some gaps that we had to fill and so to sort of figure it all out, I just, I just started journaling and with the advice of Miguel and Ryan, I managed to come up with some form of, of backstory and it proved to be very, very useful. So I think that ties into the family thing as well is that there's a lot of Alison's family that you don't see, um, but for the relationship between Alison and Otto family is such a, a key word because it's all about bloodline. I mean, that's kind of what the show's all about. Is there anything you could share that you found through that process? I think it just gave me a deeper understanding of Alison. I think she's so multifaceted. There's so many layers to her. I think lots of people are expecting her to be the villain of the show already, but um, I think bringing her in younger, there was a lot more to explore. Um, I think we were saying earlier as well that we didn't really talk to our all the counterparts, um, because there's such a huge character progression for both Alison and Rhaenyra. Um, I've never had the freedom to be able to create a whole human being like this before, so it was it was so much fun being able to go so in depth with that. Um, we heard a lot about the. Is, it, is there even such a thing as as a hero and a villain in this story for our group? Well, it depends on how you define those terms. Um, we're not going to have, you know, anyone who's called Lord Evil or, or <laughs> Mr. Atrocity or anything like that. And, and uh, we, we don't have um, orcs or trollocs or, or, you know, any like that. When, but they're certainly evil. Um, I always believed in the most interesting characters are great characters, like. Um, all the human beings I've ever met and read about them are capable of generosity and love and doing good and then the next week they do something selfish and bad and you know we all have things to be proud of, we all have things to be ashamed of and then, to my mind, um, you know, I've, I've, I'll quote once again William Faulkner uh, who in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech said, the only thing that's worth writing about is the human heart in conflict with itself, and that's uh, something I've always uh, taken as a, as a mantra here. But um, all of these characters, uh, you know, have good in them, have evil in them, and it's a matter of what, what choices they uh, they make. And I like the fact that uh, the readers of, of Fire and Blood um, divide it as to who actually is the hero and who actually is the villain. <laughs> I hope the, the viewers of the show will have the same uh, the same issues here. We probably should have seated this audience with greens on one side and blacks on the other. <laughs> we're, not there, we're not there yet, George. Oh. <laughs> we're, we're very united right now. The crowd is very united. Everybody is very happy. We're, we don't want a war within the audience. So we'll see that <laughs> next, next year. Yes. <laughs> What's it like to ride a dragon? I'm sure a lot of us have imagined it in this room uh, for our dragon riders. What's that experience like? 
The only dragon I have ever ridden in my life is um, the one from the never ending story. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I, I don't ride a dragon in the show. But I was in the film studios in Germany 